From Clyde Golden, I'm Tim Yaden, and this is Input Doc. It's the podcast where we explore what marketers need and what agencies provide. In this episode, I'm chatting with Eric Milano. Eric is creative director and co-founder of Photon Factory, a design studio and cultural space located in Seattle's Georgetown neighborhood. He recently completed his fifth year as an agency owner. Here's our conversation. And you roughly look like your image also. This is pretty good. <laughs> I'll, send you, I'll send you a screen cap. That's awesome. Perfect. Yeah. I'm glad I look like me. How are you doing? <laughs> you know, like, how's your stress level? Yeah, during this time, um, I guess the stress level's been somewhat manageable, but mostly work has been busy. Mm -hmm. So that's where most of the stress is coming from, which I like to call good stress. There's like the stress of not knowing where the next project is coming from. And then there's the stress of having too much work. Mm -hmm. And I realized that's a better stress to have, or I prefer that stress. Tell me about your agency and the year that you founded it and why you decided to start an agency versus being a freelancer or going and getting a job. (laughs) <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so I'm the co-founder and creative director of Photon Factory, which is uh, we like to call a creative studio for brave brands. So we love doing branding, motion, and experiential, um, which essentially is like looking at brands in both 2D and 3D. So how do you express a brand in a physical space, but also online and in print? And one thing that's super cool about our studio is that we call ourselves a hybrid organization. So it's half design studio, half cultural space. So with our design work, we use that to host art events, live music, um, art shows, poetry readings, community dinners. So our space is really multi-purpose in that way. Where did you come up with that idea? Um, Yeah, I think a lot of, A lot of how Photon Factory started was around what I felt was lacking in sort of general work culture or office culture. So originally, I was working at Microsoft after going to art school, and I felt like everything that we were, uh, or I was sort of taught in terms of preparing for a career was to work really hard in school, interview at you know the best or top companies, and land a solid nine to five job with good benefits, and then your life is set. Like pretty much everything else should take care of itself. Uh, but yeah, being at Microsoft taught me a lot about how uh, sort of repetitious and monotonous a nine to five structure can be. Um, yeah, and being in college where there's so much freedom, there's so much creativity, uh, you sort of set your schedule to a certain degree. There's like a lot of you know, your social life and your sort of creative work life are all blended together in college. And then once I got into sort of an office environment, it just felt very mechanical. Like wake up at the same time, drive to the same desk, you know, work as hard as you can and then leave somewhere around 4.30 to 5 o'clock and catch the bus back and then do it again. Um, yeah, and I just felt like like there has to be more to life than this. And if this is what I'm going to do for the next 40 years of my life, um, I know that this isn't going to make me happy. So I really wanted to explore what a workspace could be. So Photon Factory is really... Uh, sort of like my exploration of that. Where else did you work when you got out of school? Yeah, so I went to school at Art Center in Pasadena. So I studied graphic design, uh, worked at Microsoft right after school for a couple years, and then worked at Digital Kitchen uh, right after that. So that's where I really started to learn more about experiential marketing, thinking about immersive environments, and how brands, how brands express themselves in physical spaces or at trade shows or Comic-Con or, you know, sort of guerrilla style marketing, like on the street, 
uh, Digital Kitchen was such a like a cool sort of incubator for ideas like that. Um, and Digital Kitchen got got me to see what a smaller team looked like. So I think there's about 40 or 50 people in our office in Seattle. Whereas at Microsoft, uh, our team was around 90 people. And then overall, the company has, at the time, had around 100,000 to 120,000 employees. Um, so just the scale of things really shrunk down. And I could really see how an agency was run. I could see the accounting person. I could see the project manager. I could see the decision makers. Um, so that taught me a lot about uh, how to run an agency. So it was the culture of being a digital kitchen and the variety of things you got to work on. Uh, do you remember your employee number at Microsoft? No, I don't remember my employee okay. number. I was at Oracle and I was 150034, which is every creative's dream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they have a serial really number that high. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It feels really good to have a, a number associated with your role. <laughs> Absolutely. So what was the moment, uh, what was there, was starting an agency or going out on your own something that you did, um, I guess you did on purpose or you, you, you just made a decision, I'm going to do this, or did you fall into this or did you get laid off from somewhere and you needed to make a choice or like, was there a choice involved or did, did you not choose this? Yeah, no, that's an awesome question. Uh, Microsoft was a layoff. And because of that, I, I needed to rethink my whole reason for being in Seattle because that's why I moved from Los Angeles. And then at Digital Kitchen was where I learned how exciting an agency can be, but also that I wanted more than that um, in terms of what I wanted my life to look like. So I started to plan uh, sort of a transition to starting my own studio. And that's something that I've pretty much always wanted to do since I was like 15. It's like, I remember having this conversation with my dad that like one day I would love to have my own design studio. Um, so that was clear for a while, but I just didn't know exactly how to get there. Um, but yeah, I feel like it was very intentional, but I just didn't know exactly when to do it. And also it was completely frightening to ever Imagine leaving a stable job with benefits and saying all of my income now needs to be figured out by me and my partners. Looking back now, and how many years has it been since you started Photon Factory? Uh, yeah, we started in 2015. 2015. So, so mm -hmm. what, looking back now, what were your major blind spots and did you know that they were blind spots? And what what were your weaknesses that either you needed to find somebody to backfill or that you needed to learn yourself? Yeah, I think, I feel like marketing was probably our biggest blind spot. And it's so strange being in a marketing world, but also not doing enough marketing for ourselves. Like we'll help other people build their brand but sort of our website tends to be the last project that gets updated, uh, which is sort of a project in itself. Uh, but also realizing like, what is our sort of SEO strategy so people can find us easily? Are we writing blog posts or doing interviews or speaking at conferences? Um, and a lot of that we hadn't done. So we were really just going off of our own face-to-face, -face, you know, networking uh, connections, past coworkers, um, past friends who referred us. Uh, and surprisingly, that kept us going for quite a while. So I wish we were more intentional about marketing in the beginning. Have you budgeted money at this point for marketing? Um, right now, we're actually working out a pretty cool deal with a marketing strategist where we're working for trade. Um, so we're providing branding services, uh, brand strategy, and some website visual design in exchange for SEO, analytics, um, and just general marketing, digital marketing strategy. So, 
I feel like that's a fun way that we can support each other. I, f- I find that a lot of us are great at marketing other people, great at elevating or diagnosing other people's problems and coming up with solutions, but we don't always take the time to, you know, look at ourselves and say, well, how are we going to walk this? And I think that goes back to deciding what your agency's focus is. Can you describe to me from day one when you started uh, to how you landed at what your focus is now? Was it organic or was there a process to get there? Yeah, uh, I think it was more organic. It really started based on what our, where our expertise lied. Um, so looking at originally it was yeah, branding, motion, and video. Uh, which originally was our skills, and then we really refined it down to branding and motion, also because one of our partners is no longer in the business who focus on video. So there are like those structural changes too, uh, where the skill sets aren't in-house anymore. Um, Yeah, and then the experiential aspect, I think was something that I personally was really interested in. Um, And also, I think with the rise of like Instagram and having really like photogenic spaces, like retail spaces, uh, places that have like these beautiful like photo moments or murals or cool neon artwork behind you where you're really encouraged to take a photo and share on social. Um, I felt like there was this growing need to create these beautiful branded spaces beyond just a sign over the door. That's interesting. So say going into a lobby and there's a brand wall or just the overall experience of what is it, what is it, what's the lighting like, or what's the music like, or what's, what's the tone and the mood of this place? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like Starbucks is a great example of a really holistic experience. Um, I wouldn't say it's the most visionary or creative, but they do think about what is the playlist? Yeah. How do people feel in the space? What kind of furniture do we choose to make sure people are comfortable, but we also feel or look like a modern or contemporary uh, design-centric space? Um, Yeah, even like the temperature of the environment, the signage that they hire local um, sign painters. So you get that sense of like community versus just mass producing signage Um, or having a community wall where you can see local yoga instructors or local businesses kind of share what they're doing. All of those things add up to uh, that experience or that sort of flow of a customer from the moment they walk in to the moment they leave. Is there a size of company you're looking for? Um, You know, from startup through Fortune 500? Yeah, somewhere between, I think like the the mid-size business to... I guess it it helps kind of to put it into like uh, employee count too. Um, Sort of like companies between like 50 and 500 employees. I feel like feels like the sort of comfortable space um, where there is a marketing budget. There is um, sort of a little bit more of a a detachment from uh, the source of money. And what I mean by that is when you're a small entrepreneur or a mom and pop sort of shop, the attachment that you have to your money is really personal. And there also is that emotion or that stress that comes with spending that money, I think shows up in the design process uh, where people can be a little bit more controlling or more micromanaging. Uh, versus somebody who is, you know, a director of marketing or director of communications who's simply managing a budget that they've been allotted. Um, So I think there's a little bit more detachment in the sense that it's not their baby or it's not uh, money coming from their own pocket that maybe could affect their family or could affect their future. Um, So I think in that sense, that helps make the process a little bit more Uh, objective and focusing on the project where there isn't so much personally at stake. Um, And so I've I've noticed that difference. So that comes from experience. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, definitely. (laughs) Here's your loaded question of the day. (laughs) (laughs) So what are you working on right now? We're coming up with a lot of uh, creative content and motion design for Washington Federal Bank. So they're building a new headquarters in downtown. And 
the architecture is being redone, the interior sort of experience is being redone. And they have these huge, beautiful displays, some as tall as like 12 feet um, digital displays that they don't have any content for. So they knew they wanted digital. They knew they wanted something that felt immersive, but they're like, now what do we put on it? Um, so our company was called in to figure out what goes on those screens. So some of the content strategy, but then how does it align with their new branding? Cause they just recently did a rebrand last year. Um, so really looking at their brand guidelines, looking at what's important to the customers and then using splashy, beautiful, colorful motion graphics to add to that banking environment. So when, yeah, when, motion content. When you first engage with a company like this, how much thinking do you do before they pay you? This pitching process probably took a few months uh, just to get them confident in what we could do. Um, but yeah, it was really, it was a really good investment of time because the project has been sort of like a year long uh, engagement and yeah, hopefully we can continue that relationship as well. In those few months of pitching, did you have to come up with mood boards or examples? Or was it more of a question of they just needed to get to get used to you as a person? Um, yeah, I think it was a mix of both, but a large part of it was the strategy. So we partnered with a digital agency called New Reach, who focuses on digital displays, the installation, partnering with architects. And from the client's perspective, they thought, well, we already have an agency that does our video work for TV spots and um, online uh, video content. And we already have a branding agency that just did our rebrand, uh, which was Siegel and Gale. Um, and we already have a web partner who does our website. So why do we need another agency working with us? Don't we already have what we need? So yeah, a big part of that was just really sharing um, what our role was in getting all of those different pieces together and sort of acting as like a hub for all that content. We have all these different partners, but all of this content is in different places. We can work as that hub to gather video content from your film partner and put it up on these displays. We can work with what's on your website or the latest content from there and put it on these displays. Uh, we can take your branding guidelines that you just created and add motion to them, which you haven't seen before, and put them on these displays. So whatever you're creating out there, we'll bring it together and we'll you know, we'll introduce it into your built environment, your actual bank location. So it was kind of telling that story. How do we fit in? You know, there's a huge acquisition cost to land a client and then you do the gig and then it's over. And what you want is budgeting things on a quarterly basis with a long roadmap. And maybe for you, it's a, maybe it's ongoing maintenance that you would sell. It's, you know, or season, season, seasonal sort of updates to a environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm also part of this group. Uh, we do monthly meetings. It's different uh, creative agency founders that just get together for coffee. And we call it creative leader support group. So it's really uh, not only a place to just share uh, our own experiences and sort of business insights, but also like just the stress of being uh, an agency founder and actually being there to support each other. Um, and one of the things I was asking this exact question of like, how do we switch to more retainer work and spend less time pitching? Uh, and one of the books that was recommended was Win Without Pitching by Blair Enns. And this idea of simply putting together three different options of pricing packages allows the client to really choose the scope themselves and also gives them um, sort of options that fit for them rather than this huge, you know, uh, elaborate proposal that you put together and put so much love into. And all they do is skip to the last page that has the budget on it and looks at the number, which happens quite, quite often. It's like, not, not super excited about what you put together, but really, you know, emotionally, uh, you know, shocked or uh, taken aback by the number that you put together that you really feel you're worth. Uh, but all of that effort in designing this beautiful pitch 
might not even be the thing that, um, you know, helps you win or lose a project. Um, so that's something that, that we're trying to figure out too, is the sort of win without pitching process. I just read that book by chance in the past couple of weeks. And yeah. What did you take away? Not giving away your thinking before you get paid. Um, it talked about three steps. One was focusing and finding your niche and then building expertise. And so people see who see that you are different than everybody else and you are an expert in this and therefore the pitch isn't needed as much because they have a sense of what they would get from you. And then the third choice uh, or the third part was um, pricing. And, and I asked around, um, I was thinking about this too, and price security, is the risk on me or is the risk on you, the client, appears to be the thing that's most interesting right now. And during a recession for a, for a marketer, they would like to know per month roughly what this is gonna cost. So there are no surprises unless they can budget it. I'm curious if you've ever considered this um, performance-based. You have a goal that you need to hit and there are some things we can control in hitting that goal. And if you hit that goal, we will get paid and we'll get paid more, a higher, a higher amount, but we won't get paid if you don't hit the goal. Mm. And I'm- yeah really measuring the success of the project. I'm thinking quite a bit about this because for three and a half years, the economy was flying and I could not get out of the way of work. And now I'm finding that I'm still getting a lot of leads, but the types of conversations have changed. Yeah. And I think what I realized too is like, I, I love calling it like the roller coaster of running a business. Like how do you get the roller coaster to sort of flatten out and be more consistent and more predictable rather than really high highs where it's so busy and so packed and then really low lows where no one's calling. Um, and that I feel, yeah, like you mentioned is like the Holy grail trying to figure out that process and, yeah, knowing how to create the right engagements, uh, like this idea of you know, saying we only do six month or we do 12 month engagements and here's what those six months looks, look like. And it's just kind of, those are your options. You, you get this uh, consistent set of our support. Um, we don't do just project-based. Um, That's interesting. Or there's a minimum amount that we're looking for that if all goes well that you'd spend over the course of the year, we're looking for a $50,000 engagement over 12 months, et cetera. Yeah. It's kind of making it time-based rather than uh, sort of project or sort of lump sum based, which then allows us as agency owners to have a, a six month sort of vision uh, to look out to or a 12 month, um, which should be, really nice to have more of that predictability. So let's see here, shifting gears a little bit. As an agency owner, what are our responsibilities, uh, you know, um, with Black Lives Matters uh, protests, uh, mm -hmm. we have a recession, there's many economic discrepancies. I mean, th there's a lot to talk about and there's a lot going on that is, um, you know, obviously just outside the scope of your normal day-to-day -day work, but then you think about it and you're like, no, it's really not. It really is the fabric of what we do with our entire day. And we should think about this, that yeah. who we work with, who we hire, um, you know, even I think who we hire is an interesting question as far as how do we meet the people who we're interviewing and, you know, what are our preconceived notions ahead of time when we're thinking about a position and background? And, and I'm curious for yourself, uh, what is your responsibility as an agency owner? Yeah, yeah, it's such a big question because um, it's all about the perspective that we have on what is our role in society. Um, and our whole, our whole society is built around business and around making money. Uh, selling products or offering services is at the center of our life. So as we were saying, like, who gets access to jobs? Um, yeah, what does the makeup or sort of cultural or ethnic background of your team look like? Um, if there isn't enough diversity, why is that? Um, what biases might you be carrying as an agency owner that 
uh, encourages you to hire one person over another. Um, yeah, and just really looking at uh, the history of our country all the way to today. Um, who wasn't allowed to get hired for certain jobs? Who wasn't allowed in the uh, the men's club as white men or white passing men? We've had generations to build wealth and generations to build opportunity. So how do we just very consciously shift some of that power, shift some of those resources to communities who haven't? Um, yeah, and that happens in, in the workplace. Who are you hiring? And what a lot of people mention also is just including somebody in your office, like, hey, we let someone of color into our space, that's not enough. Uh, how do you create a sense of belonging for that person? How do they have a sense of uh, power or a seat at the table to make decisions? They're not just working for you, but they can help guide you know, the direction of the business or they can have you know, executive level roles as well, not just junior roles. As an agency owner, what, what, can you tell me about the most difficult moment you've run into over the last five years? I mean, I think about seeing the bank account <laughs> trickle down to, to a scary place uh, and wondering what's going to happen next and realizing, wow, whatever I'm doing isn't working. Yeah, I think getting to that place is one of the scariest moments where it's like, wow, this ship is about to sink. Um, and also the, the actions that come after that, uh, this idea that now you need to desperately reach out to people, you know, sort of check back in um, to past clients, uh, past colleagues, and just do whatever you can to drum up some more work. Um, that always feels so inauthentic. And I think people can sort of smell that desperation or that eagerness. Um, and I think we all have to do that in sales to some varying degree. Uh, but that was something that made me want to take marketing more seriously, which was I want to you know, plant seeds in a gentle way, in a exciting and... Uh, intriguing kind of way we're like hey we're doing exciting things it would be great to work together check out what we're doing versus hey is there anything you need in the next few weeks or the next month uh it would be great to work together again and people are like well what's the rush like what's going on <laughs> so it's like well that helped really um think about a longer term plan and even when things are really good that i still need to be planting those seeds uh, for future projects. So that way we can continue this sort of, um, sort of chain of, of ongoing work. I have long lists of people who I need to check in with, and I'm always just checking in with people. Just curious how it's going. What are you working on? What's going on? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and, um, a, it's interesting. And I like these people and the people I don't like aren't on my lists and I don't call them back, but you know, you're curious, but it is digging. I think the best term I heard, heard, have heard for it is digging the well before you're thirsty. Yeah. Yep. That's a great way to put it. I'm curious for uh, Photon Factory, what's the logical next step for your agency? But deep down in your heart, what's the, what's the big goal that you're chasing? Yeah. Oh, that's, a, that's such a good question. Um, yeah, I really have a vision sort of like a, a 10 year vision for, um, for our team and even just future team members that I haven't met yet is really to have um, a multifaceted space that we own. Because uh, right now we're paying rent or leasing a space uh, for our office, which is common, but I would eventually like to have uh, a true creative center um, where we own the building and uh, <laughs> there are parking spaces off to one side, which we could use for maybe outdoor events or talks or music performances. And it's by the water where we have a slide from the second floor going down directly into the water. If you ever needed to leave a meeting and cool off, um, after a long, hard conversation. Um, yeah. And even things like, uh, a sort of general flex space where we could have 
uh, a classroom or a meeting space so people could rent it out and we could have members of community be part of the space um, or a dance studio that is also part of our design studio. So there's places for your body to move. There's places to sit down and do computer work. Um, but that's, that's sort of the vision that I imagine is truly creating a space that we've designed um, for ourselves as a great work environment, but also for other members of the community to kind of come into our work environment and hopefully help inspire what we do um, in a place that really feels multifaceted. Um, and everything is everything that we're doing now is pretty much pointing towards that, you know, eventually, eventual ownership of property or creation of a, of a space that's truly our own. It is interesting. You're one of the few fellows I know that live above the shop. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a work live space is something that a lot of people, I think, aren't really familiar with. Uh, but what's interesting is that the first design internship that I got, I asked, um, I asked the two owners who were illustrators and designers, sort of hybrid uh, artists. And I asked them, I was like, why do you rent this big office space? Um, can't you do everything from home? Like everything you do is on a Mac and you could do it on a laptop if you really wanted to. What's the point of having space? And their response was just like, you know, I think to us, it really means something that we've sort of made it in our career to some extent. And that we, you know, sort of create an intentional space for work and for collaboration um, versus just doing it from home. Um, and that's just, it's such an interesting thing to question now, because now that everything's virtual, uh, because of the pandemic, uh, I think a lot of people are thinking about that. Like, what really is the difference? Why am I spending so much time away from my family? Uh, why am I spending so much time not seeing my kid grow up? Um, because I'm at the office all day when I can actually do this from home. Um, yeah, so I hope, I hope people question that more as we, <laughs> as we move forward. Cool. Well, thank you very much uh, for joining. Um, this was a really great conversation. And we ran through a lot of topics and it's, it's always interesting to chat with you. So you're in Los yeah. Angeles right now. And how long will you be down there? I'll be here until Sunday. So August 2nd. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what a workcation looks like. So how can I travel and be in the same time zone, see some new places, but also take meetings and emails in between. Um, so it's kind of like a, a prototype for maybe a future studio on wheels. It's nice to have a well-placed client in Los Angeles and San Francisco because there's good restaurants and interesting things to see. That is good advice for sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. And I'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for having me. Input Doc is produced by Megan O'Neill, edited by Lily Chu. The music you're listening to is an original creation by our very own Brian Leahy. We'd also like to thank our project manager, Scott Greger, who does all the work at the agency while we make this podcast. I'm your host, Tim Yaden. Have a great day.